Good morning. That's pretty pathetic. I mean, when Roger did it at the start, there was about a third of you here. So now we have oh, so many more. And it was no louder than when Roger said good morning. Let's try it again, OK? You ready? Good morning. Good morning. Much better. You know, you can go to sleep now. That's okay, but to be asleep before the speaker comes up, it's just, it's tough to take. All right, so as <coughs> many of you know, <coughs> excuse me, we've been talking about taboos, things we do not talk about in church, politics, money, sex, and since we talked about those other two already, we're stuck with the last subject this morning, which is sex. And just a, a, a bit of definition as we start, uh, I will follow our culture and use sex and sexuality interchangeably and not be real technical on, on, on those terms. And so what do I have to say about sex? Sex is good. God said so. Contrary to popular belief, the Bible takes a very positive view of human sexuality. Look at Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. It is God who invented sex. He didn't have to do it that way, did he? But he chose to do so for his own good purposes. And so he's made us sexual beings. And it's his design and purpose. And really, sexuality defines who we are. Every cell in our body is sexually oriented. Sex is far more than the mere, a mere description of what we do. It truly is who we are. And after God created us as sexual beings, we read in verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Oops, I, I was wrong. <laughs> Sex is very good. And, and the reason that he created us as sexual beings, the reason there's sex, is really, as I see it, twofold from scripture. Um, and it might be surprise, surprise you the order of the importance of this. It is, first of all, God ordained intimacy between a husband and a wife. God has designed sex in such a way that it causes a husband and a wife to come together and be one. And that's a lot more involved in that than just the, the, the physical act. There's, there's commitment, there's care, there's concern, there's love, there's tenderness. That's all involved in that. God created that. And that's a primary purpose. And secondarily, it is for procreation, so that we can multiply and have more children, so that we can uh, populate the earth. And in the beginning, sexuality was not an embarrassment. Genesis 2.25, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And uh, there, there was a famous guy in Berkeley who would go to all his classes, walk around campus and everything, and he was called the naked guy because he was always naked. But that's quite unusual, all right? Um, it was God who had to, to, uh, to take care of that, and we'll see that in a minute. But after the fall, there was still only Adam and Eve, okay? But all of a sudden now, it seems wrong to be naked. The fall corrupted what God had made, what was so wonderful. Um, but just because the fall took place doesn't mean that the Bible then takes on a negative attitude towards, towards sex. Um, in the midst of, of, of the uh, writer of Proverbs to a young man to flee or keep away from 
from adultery, we read these verses. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the love of the wife of your youth. A lovely deer, a graceful doe, let her breast fill you at all times with delight and be intoxicated always in her love. This is the description of what it's supposed to be like between a husband and a wife. Sex is not wrong. It's right and proper. And so it's to be celebrated. And that's what God intends here. Um, the Psalm of uh, Solomon. Uh, there's a lot of controversy with that. Uh, is, it, is it love letters between a man and a woman talking about the joy of intimacy in a marriage relationship? Or is it more allegorical in speaking of Christ and the church and their love for one another? Um, even if you take the, the extreme to say that it is only about Christ and the church, still very long, strong sexual imagery is used to convey that love. And so the Bible's not shy about that. We're probably more shy about it than the Bible is. Um, in the New Testament, that perspective does not change about sex from the Old Testament. Because sin was so rampant in the time of the New Testament. Uh, and by the way, it's the same then as it is today. There is nothing new under the sun. It, but it was so pervasive in the culture that there were those who were calling on Christians not to marry. They were calling on Christians, not if you are married, not to have sex. And we see Paul's response to that. Paul says that it is sin not to have sex in your marriage. Look what he says in 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Sex is a normal function between a husband and wife in a marriage. And look what he says here. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps, and even then, maybe not, except perhaps by agreement, both the husband and the wife have to agree to do this. For a limited time, we're talking hours or days, certainly no more than that. How much time do you need to take for concentrated prayer? Certainly not weeks and months and years. So it's a very limited time, and it's for one reason, to devote yourself specifically to prayer, and then to come back together again. And if you don't, if you don't, you're showing lack of self-control. Oh, I thought not having sex was, show, was showing self-control. Not in marriage. In marriage, if you're not having sex, you're showing lack of control. Quite the opposite of what people expected Paul to write. No? Maybe kind of shocking to us our, ourselves as we read this. Let's keep this in context because I want us to look at 1 Corinthians 7, uh, 3 through 4, which is just before this. The husband should give his wife her con uh, con uh, conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. The husband's desire should never be for self-gratification. The husband's desire is always, or should always be, to please and satisfy and take care of his wife. That's now his body to take care of and, and, and to please. And the same is true from the other side. It's no longer the wife taking care of herself, but it's her place to take care of her husband. So sex is never selfish, but selfless. And so it is never to be forced, it is never to be coerced, and it's never to be denied. That's the, the, the biblical concept of sex in the marriage. The husband is there to please his wife. 
not himself. The wife is there to please her husband, not herself. And when you don't do that, then you fall in all, into all kinds of sexual temptation and in all kinds of sin. And so that's what scripture has to say about sex so far. Well, the question becomes then, if sex is so good, why is it so bad? And hopefully you've noticed when I've been talking about sex here and sex being very good, it is always within the context of a husband and wife. For that's the only legitimate place that that is to be shown. Okay? Sin screwed up everything. Our sexuality is corrupted by the fall. And the outward signs of that corruption was the recognition of nakedness. And Yahweh God made for Adam and Eve, Adam and for his wife Eve, clothes of skins and clothed them. Or, okay, garments and clothed them. God is the first design expert. And he clothed them to cover their nakedness. Um, I think that's probably why all of us are wearing clothes today. Because we understand that, that our sexuality has been corrupted and fallen. And so it's proper for us to be clothed now, to cover that because of the fall. Okay? As a matter of fact, everything was, crea was corrupted, even to the point where childbearing has now become a great pain because of all of this. The, the phys physical and emotional aspects of, of, of the, the sexual act between a husband and wife have been corrupted and made hard because of, of sin. And so we see all of this. It, became, it gets so bad that God had to command things about sex. Uh, people went so far in their deviation from, from the norm and from the per perversion of sex that God had to spell out a whole list of prohibitions and punishments uh, in the law. He had to, has to describe there who you should or should not marry. You know, not too close of a relative. So he limits that and says this is, this is right and proper. He has to spell that out. Because people were parent, marrying their own parents, having sex with their own parents, having sex with their own brothers and sisters. And God said, this is wrong, and started putting that out. Uh, he also said that sex outside of the marriage covenant, marriage relationship, is wrong, no matter what form it takes, whether it be premarital sex, be it adultery, be it homosexuality, be it prostitution, either being one or using one. All of those are wrong. I mean, it, it was so bad and is so bad even to this day that he had to write prohibition against having sex with animals. That's how far from good we've gone in evil in using sex. So the question is, how do we avoid pro, you know, violating God's word about sex outside of the marriage? We go to 1 Corinthians 6.18. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexual immoral, immoral person sins against his own body. Sexual sin have ramifications that are different than other sins. Um, with our other sins, we're told, like in James, to resist the devil and he will flee from you. With, with sexual immorality, we're told to flee. We're told to run away. Run for your lives. And that's no joke. Joseph did. He's a slave in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife takes and looks at him and says, Hey, he looks pretty good. I would like to have sex with him. So she caught him by his garment saying, Lie with me. Have sex with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. Flee sexual immorality. David did not. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing 
and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. He didn't flee. He didn't say, oh, I shouldn't be here. He said, oh, that looks pretty good. Who is that woman? And we know the consequences of the disastrous uh, conduct involved, both for David, the baby who died, uh, Bathsheba. We know the consequences for the entire kingship. It's given over to others because of this. Not only that, the entire nation of Israel is caused to suffer because of this sin, because he refused to, to flee. And if these consequences were put on David, who was a man after God's own heart, we who got, are God's children should not expect to escape God's judgment on us when we do these things that are wrong. Um, let's look at another verse on this. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother or sister in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us to impurity, but in holiness. For whatever reason, God puts a premium on sexual purity, on sexual activity only within the confines that he's given that, so that our very sanctification is wrapped up in this. And, and so he says, you're, you're to abstain from sexual immorality. It is a big deal to God. And it should be a big deal to us, his children. In Galatians chapter 5, we're told the fruit of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the flesh is sexual immorality. The fruit of the spirit is, the whole, is um, um, abstinence, uh, purity. And so, self-control. And so, what are we operating in? Are we operating in the flesh? Or are we operating in the spirit? That's our sanctification, our whole salvation. All of this is, is, is tied with sexual purity. Uh, and I want to go back to 1 Corinthians 6.18. Flee from sexual immorality. This word translated sexual immorality is the same word we use in English Porn, pornography. So you can just as easily read there, flee from pornography. Now, we live in an age of the Internet. And the Internet has been able to give us many wonderful things. We're able to do many wonderful things with it. But we're also able to bring porn right into the perceived... Um, and uh, our own home, okay? We bring it right into our own home. But it's not anonymous. God knows. But we bring that in, and we look at that. And he says, here, flee pornography. Run away from it. Do not look. Run. Run for your life. Now I'm going to ask some questions here because this is a whole section on sex so I'm going to ask some questions and the first of these deals with this directly what's the harm in just looking I'm just looking what's the harm in that well Jesus said but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart in her heart in his heart this applies to women as well as men, but he, he directs it primarily to us. You see what Jesus is saying? To look is just as damaging, just as sinful as, as being in an affair. And there are consequences. There is no look 
without consequences. And so flee immorality. Uh, another question that comes up a lot of times when we talk about these things is, is what about masturbation? You never thought you'd hear that word from the pulp, did you? Okay. I'm going to show you exactly what God says about that. doesn't say anything. There is one scripture where this is mentioned, but the context of that scripture is not about the act, it's about a different sin that's taking place. And so you can't really draw a, 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 uh, anything about that into this issue. But it is something that you and you alone have to answer to the Lord for. What will you say to our Savior? And if lust and porn is involved, we already know that's wrong. Another question that comes up. How far is too far? I have a boyfriend, I have a girlfriend. What are we allowed to do? What are we not allowed to do? Anywhere from a simple kiss all the way to just before intercourse, because after all, we know that sexual intercourse is wrong outside of marriage. So where in that wide spectrum are we allowed to go? Well, I'm going to answer that question with a question. How far would you go if the Lord Jesus Christ was sitting there right with you? Because he is. Would you be able to look the Lord in the eye and say, I have done nothing wrong. Honestly look the Lord in the eye and say that. And could you also honestly look to the Lord and say, I did him or her no wrong. Because you will have to answer that question. How far? How far do you think God will let you go? Scripture doesn't say, but it gives us the principle. And so those are a couple of the questions that come. The, the last question I have um, probably will cause us the biggest challenge to our thinking, particularly in this culture, in this time, okay? When should a person marry? Well, God tells us biologically. Um, when he created us, he created us to be able to, to be married and to, to procreate by our late teens. This is God's timetable, not mine. Now couple that with some verses. 1 Corinthians 7, 2. But because of the temptation uh, to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each wife her own husband. Why, Mary? Because of the temptation. But if you cannot exercise self-control, well, they should marry. It is better to marry than to burn with passion. When do we normally get married now? I mean, we counted a tragedy if somebody graduates from high school and then has a marriage the next month, <gasps> oh my, this will never last. This is wrong. Yet throughout all of history, these are the kind of times that people married. It is only in, in a very industrialized, very wealthy time where we want more money and things that we put this off. Let me ask you a question. Is it right to expect Christians to flee sexual immorality? while they're still teenagers? The answer to that is yes. It is right and proper to expect abstinence. But should we expect that kind of abstinence from people for 10 or more years? Do we think God expects that? I don't think so. I think we're wrong. Because even when you look at Joseph, when he was tempted, God took him out of that situation 
very shortly after the incident with Potiphar's wife. He did not expect him to stay there and over and over and over again resist that. It says here, if we have a passion and we have this, this desire, then we need to get married. We need not to dishonor the Lord. And I truly think in our culture, in our time, we are expecting too much. And unfortunately, I think the statistics show that there is a lot more premarital sex going on, even in the Christian community, than we care to face or acknowledge. And it's because we put this improper, improper burden of waiting all those years. Instead of marrying early, you can still go to school, you can still get your education and your career, but you can do it together with no impulse to go out and sin. Anyway, that's what I believe God says there. Now, because we are such sexual beings, I think that um, this message hits all of us somewhere, um, including me. I'm, my prayer and my hope with this was that we would look at ourselves, see where we're not doing what's right, be it in a marriage relationship or outside of the marriage relationship, that we would, the Holy Spirit would convict us, that we would repent, and it would also encourage us to do what's right for our own good and for the glory of our Lord. Let's pray. Father, we so thank you that you made us sexual beings. It is hard in a fallen world to live up to the expectations you have for us in marriage and before we're married. There's issues and problems that we need to face. Fleeing immorality is hard now because it's so easily accessed. Father, may we repent. May we realize there are horrible consequences to not obeying you in this area. That this is an area that's very dear to your heart and that you've given a lot of time to that we should be right and proper and pure. May we repent. May we come to you and ask for forgiveness. And where we have to go to others, be it a husband, a wife, or someone else, may we go to them and ask for forgiveness and make sure that we're right with you and with them, that we might honor and glorify your name. Amen.